Okay, so what we're gonna start to see over the course of the next few lectures is sort of a shift in the position of the um, Muslims uh, living in the Latin East, vis-a-vis -vis the Christians who have settled there, um, as well as some of the Christians who then sort of continue to come down to provide reinforcements. And it's sort of a gradual process. Um, it is one of those uh, sort of moments in history when some of what we think we know is actually sort of clouded by events that happen later. So it's really easy to see sort of an, an, this very clear evolution in events sort of leading up to then the reconquest of Jerusalem by the Muslims. It's probably more sort of it happens in fits and starts. And as we'll see, even in this early period, the Muslims are still kind of figuring out how to respond to um, these sort of invading uh, Latin Christians and how to sort of figure out a way to sort of reclaim some of the lands that they lost. So we're going to sort of look at this um, period from 1118 to 1143. So there's still a lot of instability in the Muslim world um, around this time. So this is only a few decades after the conquest of a lot of the territories along the Mediterranean Sea. So Edessa, Antioch, Tripoli, and Jerusalem. Um, and what we do see is that they still have a situation where a lot of these local rulers are primarily concerned with sort of their own power, maintaining their own power, um, and they're less concerned with any sort of idea of um, this larger sort of imperative of uh, getting rid of the Latin Christians. Um, and so in part, we do see throughout this early period, uh, it's not uncommon for various Muslim rulers to actually make alliances with the Christians. So, um, for example, um, the Damascus is a frequent ally of the Kingdom of Jerusalem. And uh, we'll sort of see how that plays out in part during the Second Crusade. So the divisions really are along political, not religious lines. There's no sort of sense of the need to unify under this sort of idea of a religious umbrella. People are still very much um, sort of thinking about their own political goals. And so you have um, this very divided Muslim world still. So the Turks in control in the north there under the Sultanate of the Rum. Then you see the Emirate of Damascus. Um, then you do still have a caliph back in Baghdad. He is Arab, but the caliph has very much been reduced to just a sort of a figurehead. He does have some religious authority, but most of the political and military authority that the caliphs used to have have shifted and now that's invested with the sultan who is uh, Turkish and then you still do have so the the Turks and the Arabs for the most part are Sunni and then you do still have the um, Shiite Fatimids uh, sort of based around Egypt and so um, they're gonna also play a role in sort of the power dynamics of this area moving forward Another group that's sort of in the mix that we'll sort of reference on occasion is the Nizari. Um, they are Ismaili Shiite. Um, sometimes they're referred to um, sort of in a pejorative way as assassins. Um, the etymology of this word we still haven't quite figured out, um, but we do know that it sort of references sort of the way their modus operandi, sort of the way they operate. They originally are based in Alamut, so this is the ruins of the fortress there, so very remote, um, high in the hills. Um, they do, at this point, try and expand into Syria, and um, have, they have a number of sort of fortresses in various sort of mountain locations. They would be sort of described today as sort of a terrorist organization. Um, so the way they, they, they were always sort of a small minority group, and so the way they sort of operated is just targeting individual leaders um, and then uh, killing those individual leaders, uh, sort of spying and stealth. And the idea was sort of if you remove the leader, then any sort of organization of that group is going to fall apart. And they were um, the Shiite 
Islam. So they targeted Christians, they targeted Sunni Muslims, um, they targeted Turks. They really just were also motivated by sort of a political gain. Um, and so, for example, at one point, they assassinate the Atabag of Aleppo. Um, on another occasion, in 1152, uh, Raymond, the Count of Tripoli, is killed by assassins. So there's sort of another group in the mix that's really contributing to a lot of instability um, amongst sort of the Muslims and, and preventing any um, sort of chance of coalescing around this idea of sort of a common cause. So the first person who we see begin to make some strides towards um, any sort of Muslim counteroffensive. And I want to be sort of careful here with um, some of the terms that I'm using because uh, Zangi, Imad al-Din Zangi, um, is really a polarizing figure in sources. And I'm just talking about the Muslim sources. In some instances, he is very um, sharply criticized for some of the um, behaviors that he exhibits, but then in part because his role, particularly in the fall of Edessa, he's seen as a pitiful, a pivotal figure in sort of turning the tide in favor of the Muslims moving forward. So we know that he comes of age sort of shortly after the conquest of Jerusalem. His father is um, a very high-ranking official in the um, court of the Sultan, and so he is very familiar with um, important members of sort of the Turkish leadership. He is Sunni and he's Seljuk, um, and he uh, is very, very ambitious. He also seems to be uh, fairly sort of lucky. Um, this is a pretty sort of ruthless time in um in the in the sort of the political circle of the the caliphs and so there's a lot of instability and he manages to um, sort of survive all of that in 1123 the sultan appoints him the governor of wazit which is south of baghdad um, so this is not anywhere near the crusader states um, but eventually he sort of positions himself as uh, chosen by god as someone who is going to really sort of develop the notion of jihad um, and in part I think some of its coincidence in part some of it might be conscious but uh, eventually then he's going to move uh, further north and that's going to sort of bring him into the orbit of the Franks and so that happens in 1127 there's a number of things that happen in Mosul and Aleppo in terms of current rulers and assassinations and just um, deaths in battle. But eventually in 1127, Zengi is appointed by um, the Sultan to become the Atabag or sort of the ruler of Mosul. And then in 1128, there's a certain chain of events that unfolds and leaves him also in charge of Aleppo. And he's able to unite these two really important cities um, under his control, and they provide this really important base of operations for him um, in that territory around uh, Syria moving forward. In particular, he very much is a threat to uh, Edessa, but also to Antioch. In 1137, he successfully captures the Christian-held fortress of Montferrand, um, and 1138, he seizes the fortress of um, Atharib. This is uh, an image of the citadel of Aleppo today. So you can see this would have been an extremely formidable uh, city. So um, in terms of Zengi's sort of reputation, again, this is one of the places where the sources are really contradictory. So you see this quote from Ibn Wazil, princes feared him, lords were frightened at the very mention of him. Um, and so that sort of demonstrates that sort of one uh, perspective. In 1138, we know that um, the Byzantine emperor has come down and he lays siege to the city of Shazar. He is um, in part, he's partially successful in taking it. And you can see this manuscript image. Um, this, is the, this is one of those instances when the Byzantine emperor forced um, some of the, uh, the Latin Frankish lords. So Raymond um, of Tripoli and, uh, er, I'm sorry, Raymond of Antioch and, and Jocelyn of Edessa to sort of fight with him. And instead of actually fighting, they're sort of uh, playing chess down there in the bottom corner while the Byzantine troops at attempt to take the city. 
So you also have this sort of um, factionalism amongst the Christian uh, groups. And so John does force the, um, the, the person in charge of, of the fortress of Shazar to acknowledge his overlordship, though he's not able to um, actually take the city because Zengi shows up with his forces and John is forced to sort of leave. In 1139, Zengi attempts to conquer Damascus. This um, is an instance when it shows that um, Muslims are still uh, are still um, open to alliances with Christians. So the, the Muslim ruler of Damascus makes an alliance with the kingdom of Jerusalem against Zengi. Um, so he is not successful in that attempt. Um, and after several different ways, some diplomatic, some military, of establishing control over Damascus, he kind of gives up. And then in the 1140s, he's going to turn his attention to um, Edessa. And so the eventually the fall of Edessa in 1144 to Zengi's forces is what's going to precipitate uh, the Second Crusade. Um, and really the fall of Edessa, obviously this is hindsight, but it's seen as this pivotal moment when from here on out, you're going to see the Muslim forces increasingly unite around this notion of common cause, of jihad, able to put some of their ethnic and um, political differences aside. And increasing, um, increasingly, we're going to see sort of factionalism amongst the Latin Christians, which sort of prevents them um, from con successfully sort of uh, controlling the territories that they managed to conquer as a result of the First Crusade. So in terms of reputation, um, as I said before, and the quote by Ibn Wazil sort of um, illustrates this, he was extremely ruthless. Um, there are a number of instances of... Um, perhaps sort of going be of and above and beyond what was called for. So taking prisoners, promising them safe conduct and um, not giving them safe conduct. In fact, torturing and crucifying them. We know there's an instance when he defeats a local Muslim force and um, he takes the archers and he cuts off all their thumbs so that they can no longer sort of fight. We also know of sort of even more um, sort of disturbing stories. So there is um, uh, uh, an instance where some of his local commanders, he wasn't happy with their performance. So he lets them live, but he castrates their children as sort of a way uh, to punish them. And there's um, some stories about his wife uh, who he ended up sort of divorcing. It was a, a marriage um, that was supposed to sort of be a, a diplomatic um, alliance and it fell apart. And so um, he not only divorces his wife, but he actually gives her over to some of the grooms in the stable um, and lets them rape her while he watches. And then he has her killed. So you do have this sort of reputation. Um, he's very disciplined. He's very demanding of his followers. Um, he's very successful in terms of military conquests, um, perhaps in part because of that ruthlessness. But then you also do have this connection between Zengi and this emerging notion of jihad. So jihad in Islam has sort of two different meanings. Um, inner struggle, sort of one's uh, attempt to submit one's will to the will of God. But there is also this notion, though it's, it's less prominent in early Islam, of external jihad and sort of fighting um, to protect Islam. And sort of that's what's starting to be developed. And we see it in some of the discourse amongst these Muslim writers around this time. And in part, because of his association with Edessa, which is seen as this sort of turning point, you do see some people um, write very glowingly about Zengi. So um, in one Muslim chronicler, he's described as the adornment of Islam, the victorious prince, the helper of the believers. So perhaps um, um, painting him in a more sort of religious spiritual light than he would have sort of recognized in himself. But all of this, like I said, is because of this hindsight, because of his role eventually in the conquest of Edessa.